A big thank you comes to you today from Dead Rabbit via Patreon for his long support of the channel. Immodame vs Ventsa, Darien and Mimeoplasm. Uh, we've got some card advantage and some ramp on our first few turns, so that's looking pretty good. Got some burn to go for our commander with as well. Mimeoplasm showing us Chancellor of the Spires, so going to uh, mill seven cards. Losing seven cards from our library before we've even started, so a Rend Resolve, Swiftfoot Boot, Shadow Spear, Bonus Round, and an Abraid, and a Skull Clamp from Darien on turn one. Sensei's top from Venza, and we're last in the turn order, so see if we can do anything with this Sol Ring on turn one. Alright, Brash Taunter is some good redundancy in case we lose our commander, so rushing out our commander on turn two should be okay, I hope. Now that we've got the Brash Taunter, I'd kind of rather keep the Sol Ring than our commander, if one of them has to go down. Seeing a Chrome Mox from the Darien player, so... The white player losing some cards from hand, which isn't what you necessarily want from a mono white player. Intrepid hero. Um, yeah, mono white still struggling on card advantage in today's game. Uh, that's a crackdown for our opponent. Not particularly bothered about going into the red zone in this deck anyway. Sensei's top spinning it during the upkeep. And then play the land and spun the top again. So a land here would be good. Argument to be made for is going for Thrill of Possibility. <laughs> okay, there's a Furnace of Wrath, which means we actually need to get into a land to play that. I wonder if setting up with a Furnace of Wrath over the next few turns before we get our commander in, then maybe we can go for a Flame Slash straight away. There's not much point getting our commander down while there's no creatures to target anyway, so throw down a Mountain. Let's go for Thrill of Possibility. And we've got Delirium from this, I imagine. I think it's, yeah, four or more card types, so yeah, we've definitely got that. So yeah, let's get rid of the Flame Slash to Thrill of Possibility. Alright, and that gets us into a land and the Fiery Emancipation, so... Getting into everything we need here, just want to ramp a little bit more, but can't complain with a turn one soaring. Coiling Oracle for Mimeoplasm, and does not manage to get into a land. That's a Vicious Rumours. So going for the Vicious Rumours straight away, each opponent has one damage dealt to them and discards a card and mills. Alright, so I think we have to give up on the Bone Crusher then. It's not very good burn. And the 4-3 is a bit of a bonus to be honest, so yeah, we'll go for that. The White player getting down Soul Warden in order to start gaining some life. Only has one card available though. Not worthy that a Mana Crypt was milled over here and our opponent obviously knew about that thanks to the Sensei's top. Getting down a Reliquary Tower into a Trinket Mage this time. That will go straight into hand. Gains a life with the Soul Warden. Alright, there is a Glittering Stockpile. So do we just continue to ramp here? I mean, we've got creatures to target now. Maybe just setting up with the Furnace of Wrath is a good idea. Because we'll be able to get our Commander down straight into... It will be 12 points of damage on the creature. Making 24 points of damage on all of our opponents. Because this Commander is insane. So yeah... Go for the Furnace of Wrath. SEOR Wardwing Familiar is going to give ward to our opponent's commander. And the Mono White player is still struggling. Sensei's top spinning during the Mono Blue player's turn. But yeah, Darian not giving up on his Soul Warden. Um, he's missed out on a couple of opportunities to Skull Clamp now. I think it would be worth getting a couple of cards further into your library if you're struggling on lands. It was a Soul Ring from the Trinket Mage previously, by the way, which I didn't even bother covering because it always is. Alright, so our opponent goes for a Wayfarer's Bauble. Could be holding up counter magic for our commander. Need to be wary of the fact that once Sol Ring comes down, be able to go for Venser and bounce our commander in response to any burn. And there's blue being held up over here as well. Uh, that is a Solfim for some more additional damage. The Indestructible not necessarily relevant against blue and white players. Well, we'll stick with the plan and go for the Imodane. The Sultai player passed priority immediately, so is F6. This player is holding up priority. Might just be for the Wayfarer's Bauble, but Imodane allowed down anyway. Um, yeah, no reason to go for the Unholy Heat straight away. Can try and have our opponents use interaction elsewhere. Alright, that is an Angel of Suffering. If damage will be dealt to you, prevent that damage and mill twice that many cards. Um, okay, well that kind of switches off our deck. Let's go for the Unholy Heat now onto the Soul Warden. Takes away a Skull Clamp target over there. 
Need to just pray that the mono white player doesn't scoop in response to this. Yeah, there we go. So 12 damage to the Soul Warden. And that means that this is 24 damage to everyone. So, yeah, their life totals go plummeting down. It's a damn good way to make yourself the arch enemy. So argument to be made for us not discarding the Flame Slash previously. Need to hope that we get into some more burn at this point, but I don't imagine him or Dane will survive much longer. So it's funny, in a mono red deck, we could actually mill out our opponent. Uh, the bird swinging in towards us as punishment for that. The white player now probably regretting not going for that skull clamp. And, alright, going for Sensei's top again as opposed to this Wayfarer's bauble. Yeah, if they managed to make a land here, they could have had one in already. They could have gone for Ventsa and hold up a couple of mana, so... Oh, and of course, they've got the Sol Ring as well, so... Oh, well, alright, we have to be playing around the Ventsa regardless, unless they tap out here. Alright, they've got a Mana Vault as well, three cards in hand. And a Consecrated Sphinx, okay. So can we get into a Burn spell, is the question. Because if I decided to keep the Flame Slash, this is my first time playing this deck, and uh, yeah, I was playing around the fact that we weren't going to keep an Immordain in play in all honesty. It would have been 8 damage onto a creature and then 16 damage onto our opponents, so we would have taken out this guy and pretty much taken out the other two near enough. Anyway, we draw, and that is a Consecrated Sphinx. It's a mountain for us. How is this one worded? If a source you control will deal damage or permanent to a player, it's triple, so that does include combat damage and this includes combat damage as well this is double this one is triple so drop the mountain and do we go for we can accelerate our mana go for glittering stockpile and get down a solfin it means that we can't hold up the indestructible i don't know if i want to discard these things anyway but i think i'm fine with that let's go glittering stockpile because the more we tap this thing down the better it gets throughout the course of the game blue player still holding up some interaction here. He shouldn't mess with him or Dane until he sees where we're swinging in. Go after the Solfim as well. So this is double as well, I think. Well, it's non-combat damage on this, but still good to have him play. It was mainly the uh, glittering stockpile that I wanted to get down, really. So go straight down the middle. This is going to be eight commander damage to our opponent, thanks to the furnace. So they go down to ten and up to eight commander damage. And yeah, just a case of Passing it over and hoping that we continue to keep our commander alive. Consecrated Sphinx going to refill our opponent's hand over the next turn cycle. So now the Mimeoplasm entering play. Not, I haven't familiarised myself with the graveyards too much, but I'm assuming that he has decent targets. Alright, so just making it a Soul Warden and putting some plus counters on there. Getting rid of our Bone Crusher Giant. So basically looking to gain some life over here, which seems like a bit of a desperation attempt in all honesty. Uh, we take 6 damage in the air. The Furnace of Wrath. Yeah, it's if any source would deal damage to any permanent or player. So this is actually doubled as well. So we're going to take a decent hit ourselves. Which is the downside of that cheap enchantment. So we go down to 25 on that hit. And the white player continuing to struggle here. Just tapping out and passing. It's not worthy that thanks to the crackdown he is still having an effect on the board. Our Imodain won't untap during the next untap step, neither will the Angel of Suffering. And now for one blue mana, it is a spin of that Sensei's top again. Our opponent going round to his turn with eight cards in hand. Cloud of Fairies from the blue player ends up being free, going to untap a couple of lands here. And then a Frantic Search, going to untap the three lands that he used to cast the thing. And then deciding to discard Kozilek Butcher of Truth to that, so he's going to shuffle everything back around. And then, uh, yeah, that should finish off. I think that's, yeah, 12 damage over to the white player. Our opponent still can't afford to counter with the Ventsa, though. So anyway, the white player goes down. That does mean Imordain is going to untap now, so... Oh, okay. <laughs> and then that player scooping. Draws a hell of a lot of cards, takes a player out, and then scoops. That's a bit of a dick move. So we'll see if we can beat out the mill player now, because unless we can get rid of this thing, we can't deal any damage. Now, there's a mountain. Can we use that as just discard fodder, maybe? Perhaps a Brash Taunter would be a good idea. Yeah, I'd rather have the Brash Taunter down than the Fiery Emancipation. So, it could be our opponent could exile it, but we'll challenge him to do that. Could have got down the Fiery Emancipation, then challenged my opponent to block this. Um, that would have been 15 damage on the Emancipation alone. But this thing's in play, like I said, and they could just chump with that anyhow, so... 
Yeah, rather have the Goblin in play. Not going to swing in with him ordained because we've got the Soul Warden to contend with. And I'll try not to discard the Fiery Emancipation in order to keep Solfim around. So yeah, discarding that Flame Slash totally changing the outcome of this game potentially. Even getting rid of the Bone Crusher would have been relevant because that would have been 4 damage onto this Angel. Anyway, we've got the potential to have two Indestructibles in play. Our opponent tapping down a lot of mana for something. <laughs> and that is a Garuda, so... Yeah, about to reanimate something. We don't have that many creatures in the deck. It's mainly instants and sorceries for obvious reasons. But they gain a life to their commander. Uh, not managing to get anything from the guy Ruder, thanks to the other player scooping. That might have helped the chance along if the other player had been around still. So we're still taking 12 damage in the air, thanks to the flyers. That's 24 damage more than we should have taken if we had the burn, like I said. <laughs> Alright, that is a blasphemous act, so... Come wipe the board. We won't do any damage with it though. So do we give up on Fiery Emancipation in order to Blasphemous Act and make Solfim indestructible? Uh, this costs one, so we can just put the three mana into the Solfim, I think. But we have to discard the other two cards. And we'll still have the mana for the Brash Taunter to fight something. Uh, we could go for the Brash Taunter if I'd gone for Phyrexian Mana with life, actually. This would have been easier. I could have gone for the Brash Taunter and then the mana we lose out from losing the Coiling Oracle could have gone into the then two mana Blasphemous Act. Oh well, we'll just go Blasphemous Act here and I can swing in with the Brash Taunter. Missed out on a bit more life there. Because it would have been, again, double damage to the Coiling Oracle. Okay, it gets countered anyway. Um, so that's some more mana for us. It means that we keep our Imodane. Uh, it does mean that we can fight at instant speed. And then we've got a blocker for the Guy Ruder as well. Yeah, makes it more difficult for them to go wide on us, so... We'll do the fight at the end of our opponent's turn. Um, it's going to be double damage on the fight. And then double damage from the Brash Taunter again onto our opponent. So if we fight Guy Ruder, that'll be uh, six damage dealt to this. Two damage dealt to that is irrelevant. Uh, but then the six damage on this turns into 12 against our opponent. And it's all a case of just playing around that angel here, really. A Questing Beast can't be blocked by creatures with power two or less. And damage can't be prevented by their creatures. It does have haste as well, so I'm glad I held up the Brash Taunter now. So do they just, yep, turn everything in sideways because they're dealing double damage here. Um, so uh, let's go for Indestructible Block on the Guy Ruder. Block on the Soul Warden. Probably just get into our land next turn. Um, yeah, do they just have us here maybe? So that's five, six, and seven, and yeah, they've got us for 14, I think, so um, let's see here. Let's go for the Brash Taunter. I mean, we can't deal any damage to our opponent anyway, because, <laughs> yeah, who would have thought Angel of Suffering would become a relevant card one day? Anyway, just for the fun of it, we'll fight the Guy Ruder. But yeah, going down to our own furnace there, and the fact that I decided to discard some burn in order to be greedy and hold up the uh, double and triple damage on everything. So I think this will be a little practice match before we get a real game underway. So 6 damage from the Guy Ruder dealt during the fight means 12 damage with the Brash Taunter. And it's actually no damage dealt at all. Our opponent just gets milled instead. And then damage is all dealt at once anyway, so... We've gone down to minus 1, we've already lost. Brash Taunter on the stack doesn't matter, because, like I said, we've already gone down there. And it's a good game to our opponent, so... Yeah, I think we'll play another game. Hopefully no one scoops this time. And we'll try and actually hold on to some burn, I think. Alright, now we've got the gist. Let's try this again. Imodane versus Gishath. Partners Arden and Ludovic. And Glissa. And we have the Sol Ring again, along with the Fiery Emancipation again. So we will keep Moss Walk Bridge from Gishath on turn one. Uh, we draw into Reckless Impulse, so... Hmm. If we're going to go for the Cathartic Pyre on turn two, then... Maybe it's just worth going Sol Ring into Cathartic Pyre. And we don't run the risk of having our Sol Ring blown up on turn one. So yeah, we'll pass at that. <laughs> okay, and it's a Jeweled Lotus from the partner player. Has to go for Arden there. Alright, that's risky, just running it out and leaving it. Not sure if he's worried about targeted discard or a wheel or something like that. But any removal that goes on this won't go on to the Sol Ring. Alright, well, speaking of which, there's a Sol Ring on turn two from the Dinosaur player as well. 
Obviously could have gone for the Sol Ring on turn 1 into a turn 2 commander, but... Yeah, I was, um... Again, expecting it to be removed. Which it wasn't last game, so maybe should just be running it out really fast, but... There is a white mana being held up over here, going for a Sol Ring of our own. Druging 2, Dictate of the Twin Gods. And again, this will deal damage... Double damage to ourselves as well, so... Maybe should be more careful with things like that. We've got the Fire Emancipation, we could go for Cathartic Pyre and discard a land and the Dictate of the Twin Gods. Don't suppose there's going to be anything that we do for one mana, so we'll just pass at that. Could maybe get into Wayfarer's Bauble or something, but probably not. Blight Belly Rat now. So when it dies, proliferate, and it has Toxic 1. So seeing the rock being cracked now, Ludovic, into play. And we see an Enlightened Shooter from the Aegis Shath. Ludovic going on the stack, but no one lost life this turn, so no card drawn. And there we see a Sylvan Library for our opponents, so that should help us in a burn deck. They'll be taking potentially 8 life a turn to that thing. And again, we're throwing away some burn in the Cathartic Pyre, but with that and Reckless Impulse, I'm hoping that we'll actually get into some more targeted burn. There's plenty of it in the deck. So Ludovic on the stack again isn't going to be of any relevance. We'll get rid of Dictate of the Twin Gods. Um... Yeah, doesn't feel good, but I'm really liking the idea of this Fiery Emancipation, so kind of letting my heart rule my head, but... Okay, getting into a Snow Mountain and a Stuffy Doll, so very similar to last game. Yeah, because it would be good to flash down Dictate at the end of someone's turn and then get straight into our Commander and a Burn spell. But like we saw last game, we uh, run the risk of getting burned out ourselves, or at least taking double damage ourselves during combat. So while well, we've got a decent amount of mana, maybe we just go for the Stuffy Doll. Or maybe Primal Amulet and then a 1 mana Reckless Impulse would be good. It'd be good to get down the Stuffy Doll sometime soon, because I'll point that at the Gashath. And then it won't be as easily able to swing in at us. But yeah, let's go for this Reckless Impulse and actually try and get into some burn here. This gets its first counter on it. I think it needs 4 in order to flip over. Yeah, 4 or more counters on it. And we've got until our next turn to play these spells. Okay, there's a land and a Salfim again. So, Magic Online doing its usual trick of showing us all the same cards. But once again, could be punished for getting rid of the burn on the Cathartic Pyre. Although, it wouldn't have been a game-ending amount of life anyway. Grafted Butcher now. Enters the battlefield for actions you control, gain Menace until the end of the turn. So, this is going to deal one toxic damage to someone. They weren't going to struggle all that much with that anyway. Goes over to Gashath. So yeah, if players are focused over at Gashath and maybe the Jeskai player, then it yeah adds credence to the fact that we might be able to sneak down our commander into a decent amount of burn if we can get some lucky draws. So Ludovic is going to have a card drawn this time thanks to the combat, and that is one card drawn from Glissa. Enlightened Tutor actually went for the Sylvan Library, by the way, which... You would assume that that was the case, but didn't actually check in the revealed zone. Curiosity, going to enchant the Ludovic. And then, one that you don't see very often, but a good one, that is Beamtown Beatstick. There's a new Boros equipment deck in... Uh, well, there's a Boros equipment deck in every single set that releases now, isn't there? Um, Ludovic comes in towards us, we'll draw a card to the Curiosity. Um, yeah, it's a fairy human, I think. I don't know how you have a fairy human, but... Yeah, that one seems like a pretty cool commander, so I'll probably build that at some point. The beat stick just reminded me of it. Our opponent plummeting down to 29, thanks to that Sylvan Library. And then it's a Verdant Mastery being played for... was that... 4 mana? Oh, they could have tapped out into that, actually, yeah. Alright, we draw into another land. Um, so play the one from Exile. Almost played that one straight away there. Yeah, I think just getting down the Solfim whilst it's available to us is the thing to do here. And could discard some stuff in order to make that indestructible. Although we don't have to do that until we need to. We're up against a couple of white players again, so exile could be relevant. But we'll just pass at that. Just treading water until we get into burn again here. Seem to be struggling on getting into burn in the burn deck somehow. And now a Necrogen Rock Priest, Toxic 2. Alright, so now the Toxic going through to the middle player. And the Grafted Butcher goes to the right. So we're the only one without a Poison Counter at the moment. And it's an additional Poison Counter from the Rot Priest. Thanks to Toxic Damage being dealt over here. 
All right, a vow of duty that is enchanting our commander. So plus two, plus two vigilance, and it can't attack this player in the middle. So it doesn't really do anything to us. And then a damage will be dealt over here during combat. So Ludovic going to draw another card, as did the Golgari player. And a card drawn from the Curiosity as well. So he'll actually go above his hand size. Just desperately trying to get into a land, I imagine, because he did miss out on a land drop there. Discarding a Hexplate Wallbreaker. Uh, so there is Atali Primal Conqueror. That is probably one of the best dinosaurs in the format now. And watch this, our opponent's going to get a burn spell off us here. Oh, as if it's the Mana Geyser from our opponent. And he still has his other colours. Um, it was a Skull Clamp here. And an Azuri's Predation, which I assume he's not going to bother with. So that would have been nice to draw into. Okay, he is going for the Azuri's Predation and the Skull Clamp. So Mana Geyser... Oh, and he got a Zendikar Resurgent from his own Exile Zone. Yeah, it would have been nice to draw into that Mana Geyser, but here we go. Going to have double mana from his remaining lands, so we'll be able to keep going. Now, Azuri's Predation is going to be 4-4s, four so we don't have to go for the Indestructible. Turns out the Valve Duty is actually relevant then. Could have made our commander Indestructible anyway. So, just four damage markers on the Solfim and all the other creatures being taken out. Our opponent now has four Beast Tokens in play. Uh, proliferate will be relevant thanks to the um, thanks to the poison counters here. Would be nice if he went after the primal amulet as well. He is doing. That's excellent. So nine red mana floating thanks to our sorcery <laughs> into a great henge. Great henge was just two green mana there, so taps for two green mana straight away. And that means that the Zendikar resurgent was relevant there because it means this could tap for double green. He could still hold up the white. So maybe he goes for his commander here. Yep, there it is, the Gashath going to draw a card with the Resurgent, and when it enters we'll draw with the uh, Great Henge as well. I think this is entry and draw a card. Yep, this player scoop into that, that's ridiculous. But this is Magic Online players, the first hurdle, and they decide to give up. So plus one counter, and then Regisaur Alpha. So we're going to give the Dinosaurs haste, our opponent has absolutely everything here. Although, admittedly, it's off the back of our geyser. So, drawing a card again. Probably not doing anything here because we need to get our commander out and deal some decent burn damage. We get the Atali, which will be 7 points of damage. This is why it's important that we didn't get down the uh, damage doubling. Yeah, we get a 3-3 uh, three, three dinosaur and the commander swings into the left. So, we could give Indestructible here. Get rid of some lands and do the indestructible thing, maybe? So let's take two life. Get rid of some lands, which I don't really like doing. I was trying not to do the indestructible thing, but if we can get rid of an Atali, then it's going to be the best thing to do here. So throw that in the way of Atali and destroy it. Might be that our opponent can have a bunch of dinosaurs come in and fight and deal a bunch of damage to creatures anyway, which the only target would be our Solfim. So it might be that we put Indestructible on that sooner rather than later anyway. Both at 29 life now, 8 commander over here. And that means that it's likely a bunch more dinosaurs are going to enter. Alright, not too bad actually. Just a Telpieri Stomper going to ramp and draw our opponent another card. So our opponent passing at that has to discard down to hand size here. Just getting rid of a couple of lands. Alright, that is a Scred. So... Uh, Number of snow permanents we control straight after we discard some lands. Ugh. Yeah, so it's mana we're lacking ultimately. Let's just try and tread water. There's a stuffy doll. And obviously point that at our opponent so he thinks twice about swinging into us. So at least we've got a couple of indestructible creatures to block with now. But ideally we'd have fiery emancipation and our commander in play. We can get down our commander next turn. And um, oh, I should have swung in there because we've got... Uh, vigilance on the Solfim, haven't we? But I don't know if I'm all that interested in attacking this player anyway. Could have just encouraged my opponent to lose a beast, maybe. Anyway, yeah, get down our commander next turn into the Scred. And that would be 8 damage onto the Stuffy Doll. And that would make 16 damage onto each of our opponents. Then another 16 damage from the Stuffy Doll could get rid of this player. So, yeah, if we can survive through the next turn cycle, we don't necessarily lose this. The Stuffy Doll could dissuade the Dinosaur player from swinging in at us, which is obviously the aim here. 
Might take life from the silver library as well, especially when he's got life gain from this. And just sticking at 28. Can draw the cards by playing creatures and can stack the top of his library as well if he decides to go straight in with Gashath. Alright, just shuffle in his library. That is a three visits. Uh, really, and now this opponent's giving up as well, so... Yeah, these decisions totally warp the game. Our opponent can just turn in sideways at us now and uh, probably get rid of us. He might do the maths and realise that he can't commit to a massive alpha strike, but yeah, our opponent should stick it out there and take the hit. He just totally screws us over. Anyway, Verdant Sun's avatar comes down for some life gain. That will draw a card from the Great Henge. And this has been my problem with... Cards like this, I was really looking forward to this, have high hopes for this one. It was the same with Hilda. It was like, well, that card's really cool, but it relies on your opponents actually playing creatures. And then it relies on your opponents actually sticking a game out, which won't be a problem for most of you. But when you're playing Magic Online, you know full well that it's very much a difficult thing to have your opponents actually stick games out. So you make decisions based on your opponent's creatures being able to burn them or tap them or whatever it is and then they just vanish from the face of the earth and all of a sudden your deck switched off because your opponent's not in play anymore anyway Galta and Mavrin are in play now and they do have haste on their stuff that is a Tyrannus Rex as well so this is going to be an alpha strike might be able to go for Scred onto something I uh, don't think that's going to be all that relevant. They're probably just going to turn everything in sideways anyway. Draw a card, gain more life. So it might be that they could have gone wide on both of us anyway. Although I don't think so. Alright, <laughs> there's a source of plowshares. So they always had it anyway. So let's just go for the Scred onto our Stuffy Doll now. And put the third counter on the Primal Amulet. Four damage onto the Stuffy Doll. But we're going down to Gashath here, so... So, yeah, I think we've got a couple of quick games so far. Uh, yeah, that allows us time for an attempt at another real game, I think. Imordain versus Rakdos, Imordain and Glissa. Okay, so if there's two Imordains at the table, we'll get at least one good game in with that commander, surely. Got a... Uh, Turn two Solemn Simulacrum if we want it, which is good. We've got multiple means of burn as well, which is what we've been somehow missing. So that should be all right to keep. All right, drawing two Bergy, God of Storytelling, which is actually a turn one play that we can make now. Wasn't going to bother doing anything on turn one, but we can go for a red mana with the Forbidden Orchard. This is a way of enabling our opponents having creatures. So even if they're not creature based decks, we can give them creatures so that we can burn them. And Bergy is a means of us adding mana every time we cast a spell, which obviously makes it way easier to actually cast spells. Farseek for Glissa. And then the Spirit Token, now without summoning sickness, swings in towards Zimodane. Swift Foot Boots from the Burn player. And a Felwar Stone from the Rakdos player will tap for Rakdos mana thanks to his opponents. And we win the flip to Mana Crypt. Have to be very careful with the Mana Crypt, like we've seen in a few of the, uh, of the games here. We can deal double damage to ourselves. Get down the Detection Tower, which will be a means of us uh, removing Hexproof, is it? Yeah, this one doesn't do Shroud, it's just Hexproof. So just in case we need to target something that is equipped with a Swiftfoot Boots or something. Um, we'll throw a token over at the Rakdos player this time. And that can be a Solemn Simulacrum this turn, so that we can get some more Red Mana on the go. The uh, Red Mana made by Bergy is useless, unfortunately. And we might as well just swing straight down the middle at the Bergy player. Okay, a Kenrith's Transformation. That is going to go on to the Bergy because our opponent doesn't like us ramping with that. So we'll draw a card. It's not worthy that we can burn our own creatures and still trigger the commander. So yeah, even if we didn't have something like the Forbidden Orchard to make tokens on our opponent's side of the field. If a creature does become useless to us, then we can still burn it and deal the damage. Throwing out a Birds of Paradise now, and the Spirit goes down the middle. Okay, and then we saw a Jessica's Well from our opponent. Wasn't expecting to see the Imodane, but managed to make a bunch of red mana into Imodane. And the Swiftfoot Boots saw the Witch's Clinic as well. It is the Commander dealing damage, so lifelink on it will be relevant. And there we see a Necropotence from Rakdos. 
Going up to eight cards with that, so we'll have to exile something from his hand. Deciding to exile Shieldred, the Whispering One. Alright, there is Prismatic Vista for some more red mana for us, so play and crack that immediately. We've got the fetch lands in this monocolored deck to enable Delirium. There is... I think there's only the one card that cares about Delirium, but could be relevant. So do we play our commander here? Because I imagine it's just going to get burned by Imordain straight away. Um... And we want to be able to maybe make a mana next turn. This is why it was it's actually relevant that the Bergie goes down here. Because we could have got our commander down and gone for the Mithril Cult straight away. Unfortunately, Bergie is down now. So maybe just try and draw another card with Volcanic Spite. And could get rid of the Witch Stalker Frenzy with that. Yeah, let's go after the Birds of Paradise, seeing as how our opponent swung in at us previously. And just attempting to get into a land, alright, there is an extra planar lens. The problem is our opponent has snow-covered mountains as well. Plus we actually don't have all that many basics, so... <laughs> yeah, not doing too well here. Did get a card deeper into our library at least. And we might be able to draw off the Solemn. Basically want to drop an untapped land into our commander and the Mithril Coat. And there is a Plague Mirror. They are playing Phyrexians, so do get a Scry off the Path of Ancestry. The spirit token goes into the right, trying to trade spirits by the looks of it. Primal amulet from Imordain, so looking to just set up with all that burn apparently. And now seeing a dockside extortionist could take some mana away from our opponent here by blowing up the Swiftfoot boots with a braid. We're up against the Rakdos and Green player, so they could use removal on it instead. It's our only means of burn at the moment, and somehow struggling to get into that, so... Yeah, Dockside, gonna make some mana here. It's amazing how much faster the format is now. It's only turn four, and... Yeah, we're seeing all kinds of crazy cards here. Anyway, six mana made by Dockside. Mass Hysteria gives all creatures haste. And there we've seen Aheb, the Eternal. Alright, so there's Infernal Grasp. Our opponents are holding up spot removal, apparently. Go straight over to the Aheb. And then trying to trade the Spirit... On the Plague Mirror this time. And our opponent needs to remember to do the Necropotence thing here because he won't refill his hand otherwise. Oh, he's doing it at the end step here. So exiling the top card. Yeah, this is at the beginning. Put the card into your hand at the beginning of the next end step. Of your next end step. So he's going to have to wait through his whole turn next turn in order to get these cards now. Okay, uh, getting into Solfim yet again. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I suppose we just have to go for Solfim, don't we? I imagine if we played our commander out during the previous cycle, then the Infernal Grass would have gone on to that. So it is right holding up for an additional mana so that we can go Mithril Coat straight onto our commander, I think. Soul Ring from Glissa. And then we see Glissa, Herald of Predation. And yeah, that's a Scry 1, thanks to the land again. So at the beginning of combat, they go for Incubating 2 twice. Making a couple of tokens. Shadow Spear, another means of life gain on the Imordain deck. Um, I had Basilisk Collar and the uh, Witch's Clinic in this deck, but I decided to just go with Shadow Spear because it gives things, or it keeps things from having Indestructible. Um, and also the Life Link's good. It's kind of a little bit win more, so decided not to go too heavily into that so that we wouldn't have trouble drawing into Burn, which hasn't worked apparently. Anyway, could be holding up Burn now. Three cards in hand. Obviously equip the Imodane there. It's not worthy that our opponent could burn Solfim in response to the Indestructible counter there, but I'm going to try and hold off for as long as possible on that anyway. Now at Rakdos, still with three cards in hand, thanks to that issue with the Necropotence. Doesn't look like he's going to do anything on his turn. So just going through to the end step and drawing those four cards with the Necropotence. Alright, missing out on a fifth land by turn five, unfortunately. It's impact resonance this time. So we're not really doing anything this game, seemingly. Pass the turn again. Viridian Corruptor now, so this might go after the Swiftfoot Boots, which is why I've held on to the Abrade for this length of time. Might be that I have to Abrade my own Solemn at this point. Okay, no, it is the Shadow Spear that he's going after. Not sure why he's so worried about life game from our opponent. And then it goes round to Glissa's turn again, so... See what abilities he chooses here. First Strike and Death Touch on all of his Phyrexians. Transforming an Incubator token in response, which will of course become a Phyrexian. All the creatures do have haste, of course, thanks to Mass Hysteria, so... 
Yeah, just two damage each onto each opponent. They do have the uh, spirits to block with if they want to. Not allowing us to throw Solemn Simulacrum in the way, unfortunately. Alright, now we see a Chaos Warp. This might get us into a land. It's typical that Chaos Warp does get you into a land. Primal Amulet gets its counter. Um, so yeah, Mithril Coat doesn't really help us here. So we just take the Chaos Warp and hope it gets us something relevant. Of course, it doesn't get us a damn thing, because why would it? Let's say Mizix's Mastery on top of our library could not be more useless. So I think at this point we're just going to have to get down our commander, hope it survives, and then we can maybe abrade the Solemn Simulacrum, try and draw a card, and we'll do the burn on Solemn as opposed to uh, destroying an artifact, because then our commander will at least deal some damage. Two cards in our opponent's hand, and we haven't seen any burn from the Immodane player yet. <laughs> Alright, there is a Mizix's Mastery of his own, so targeting the Jeska's Will will get him some more card advantage. We've got these cards in our library, but... Not drawing them up yet. And Jessica's Will does count as being cast, so the Primal Amulet gets its penultimate counter. Just one more and that will get flipped. Seven cards in this player's hand, so pointed over there. And we've got some exiled cards to look at. A land, City on Fire, obviously seven mana available to our opponent. And there is a Valakut Awakening, so yeah, a lack of burn over here as well. Probably best to get down the City on Fire while he's got the chance. So our opponent does decide on the City on Fire, as you would expect. Could draw a couple of cards with the Valakut Awakening as well, so... Probably a good idea to play that. Unless he really likes the card that's in his hand here. That would flip the Primal Amulet as well if he went for that. Okay, going for Mizium Mortars instead. So going after Glissa with that one. That's only going to be 4 damage, I think. Uh, oh, of course, he's got the triple damage now, hasn't he? So... Tamiyo safekeeping in response to that will protect the commander. Anyway, Primal Amulet has been turned into the Wellspring and it will copy instants and sorceries that are cast with it. So casting Valakut Awakening, probably just to get it in the bin because it doesn't actually do anything here with zero cards in hand. But if he's got cards like Mizix's Mastery, he might have the Innistrad one, I forget the name of. It causes flashback on your instants and sorceries. Seeing Mana Geyser again, but once again it's not ours. And they make 9 mana with that, even though we are completely untapped. <laughs> there is an Ulamog, the Ceaseless Hunger, so let's see what our opponent wants to exile here. Targeting, yeah, the uh, Commander on the Golgari side and the Damage Tripler is fine. Oh, they've actually drawn 2 cards here, is that how it works? I thought it would fizzle if you didn't, um, if you didn't put a card on the bottom of your library. But yeah, they just straight up draw a card from this with an empty hand, alright. Didn't know it worked like that. And the Ulamog does have haste, of course, thanks to, once again, the Hysteria. So this makes the Impact Resonance relevant again, but we want a Damage Tripler or Doubler, really. That goes in towards the Phyrexian player, milling the top 20 cards, or exiling the top 20 cards. So you can have a look through these cards for any of you who are interested in maybe looking at quite a big chunk of the deck list here. I was going to make this deck, but it was towards the tail end... I say the tail end, like a few weeks after the set came out, and unfortunately people are only interested in the new sets for like the first week, maybe two. So I didn't get a chance to do that. The spirit getting thrown in the way of the Ulamog. So it's the end of our turn. Let's go for a spirit under the control of this player as well. Uh, maybe he'll leave us alone if we give him a spirit, which didn't work for the Kenrith transformation, but there we are. Yep, yeah, it's our commander. And like I said previously, we can abrade onto the Solemn Simulacrum and deal um, three damage to all our opponents. Draw a card in the process. Could do it here. And maybe actually try to make a land. But holding up the Impact Resonance will probably be a good idea as well. Ikarat's going to give us our first Infect Counter. First Infect Counter for the other Burn player as well. So let's see if our opponent's actually going to swing in towards us this time now that he's got some Infect available. The Incubator goes into the right. Infect, uh, the green infect goes in down the middle. And yep, still avoiding us with that Solemn Simulacrum. The, I don't know if there's a better prison effect than Solemn Simulacrum in the whole game sometimes. Most of the time, holding off on all the damage and stuff for the sake of one card draw from Solemn Simulacrum isn't actually relevant, but yeah, it kind of is this game in all fairness. Our opponents can clearly see that we're missing lands here. So uh, getting rid of the incubation token with the two creatures here. 
and deciding to get rid of the dock side. I'm not sure about that. I would have killed off the spirit but left the dock side alone. It's more likely that a Rakdos player will reanimate dock side than flicker it. Maybe you'll be able to exile it from the bin. But doesn't look like it. Dockside going into the graveyard. Big score now from the red player. So attempting to get into some more burn. Now gets copies of that thanks to the uh, the primal wellspring. So yeah, going to discard and draw two. The copy doesn't have you discard because that's part of the cost. Um, and there is no cost on a copy. So just straight up draws two to that. And then another two to big score has discarded a cathartic reunion. And making a bunch of treasures in the process as well. So let's see if there's finally any targeted burn that our opponent can go for. Okay, young Pyromancer. Not really focused on the burn in this deck, seemingly. Looking to make some tokens when he goes for his instants and sorceries. Alright, now the Rakdos player going through to combat straight away for the Ulamog. I bet the first card that's exiled is a land if they go after us. So going after... Yeah, the Ulamog's going after the Golgari player again, swinging in with the Spirit as well. So we'll be able to look at more of this player's library. Gonna have 43 cards left in the library. Glissa has something to do in response though. Transforming an Incubator token, probably just as a chump blocker. Does have a Spirit token to do that already, thanks to us. And once again, can look through the cards here if you are at all interested. Alright, so the Ica Rat's going in the way of the Ulamog, making it... That will be 8 toughness now, which might make a difference. Because there are red effects that can remove indestructible. Not worthy that a land over here is uh, another haste enabler, handwear battlements. Tapping that down for a talisman though. And now making sure to go for Necropotence during the second main. Only two cards in hand, but going to refill his hand. Most likely with Necropotence, you would assume. Also, the proliferate becomes relevant with Ulamog as well, which he can proliferate with cards in his library, you would assume, and, well, assuming that it hasn't been exiled by now, and Glissa can proliferate as well. Anyway, go through to the end step, and let's go for, I think, the first bit of burn that an Imodane deck has seen so far. So we'll go for red mana and a spirit on Imodane's side of the field. Hopefully Imodane leaves us alone if, again, we uh, give him some tokens to chump block with. Go for the three damage onto our own Solemn in an attempt to try and actually get into a land. The Golgari player holding up double green and then priority being held up by the burn player as well so oh really are you going to go after our commander for the sake of three damage? Okay <laughs> that is a radiate we've got that in this deck as well I mean I'm glad we're seeing these cards because we're doing nothing. Uh, choose a target instant or sorcery that targets only a single permanent or player and copy it for each other permanent and player the spell could target and it does target those players. So basically three damage to all the creatures and Imodane is going to do some stuff here. So Young Paramancer triggers on that which gives another target for the Abraid Radiate and you can see why I wanted to get down the Mithril Cult now although this should hopefully survive. Will we survive though? We'll see a bunch of Ibraids go on the stack here. So it's an Ibraid on Ulamog, on the Spirit, on Imodane. Our opponent's going all over the place here. Token, I mean, you can see all of these will target a different creature. Haven't seen Radiate before I built this deck, but yeah, for all the damage dealt here, our opponent is going to deal three damage to us. So Bergy going down first. And when that resolves, it puts Imodane on the stack, so three damage to all of us. And then it resolves on the young Pyromancer. And again, three damage to all of us. Then the Spirit Token, so you get the gist here. We just see where we end up at this point. Yeah, so it looks like we're going down here. We're at 15 life already. And um, yeah, that's 12. So 3, 6, 9, 12. We're just shy here. But like I said, we're going to see an Imodane game regardless, and we do have Radiate in the deck, and that's exactly the type of play that we want to make for it. So getting rid of at least two players here, it might be that the uh, the Golgari player survives this. Okay, we survive as well. I forgot that the Abraid, this last Abraid is ours, so yeah, we'll deal three damage to our opponents. That won't count on us though. So let's see if we actually manage to draw into a land after all this. Would be funny if we had the mana, yeah, finally getting into a land, typical. If we had lands throughout the entire game, then Impact Resonance would have been relevant there because of the uh, Imodane. 
We could have pointed it at our own commander and then dealt the final damage to our opponents, but yeah, this one hasn't gone our way, unfortunately. So, do we go down to the Mana Crypt? Yes, we do. Of course we do. <laughs> so, yeah, I want to see if we... Hopefully, it actually lets us draw a card here. Because I want to see what we might have been able to do there. I probably would have... No, it doesn't. Um, I probably would have swung in over at this player. That would have been 4 damage. And then, yeah, maybe just go for the 4 damage from our instant onto our commander. Um, after the indestructible mithril coat and then try and get some damage. I mean, we're just king making on the Imordain then, so maybe I wouldn't have done that. All depends on what that other card is that we would have drawn into, but yeah, we, we got too far into that game doing absolutely nothing, so just happy to see at least one of the Imordain decks actually doing something. So I'm hoping that you all enjoyed the burn here. Our opponent has cast a Worm Quake, so getting some Phyrexian Worms with Toxic. Both players are stuck on cards really here so hopefully they'll be able to do something <laughs> all right now we're talking a meteor storm you play this for just one mana into x because it's eight damage targeting one permanent and it's important that you only target one permanent with him ordain so uh, getting a copy of that thanks to the primal wellspring means that each of these will be dealt eight damage and that means that it's 16 damage to our opponents so Saw a game with this commander one way or another. Hopefully you all enjoyed it. If you want to see more with Imordain the Power Hammer, then be sure to let me know. Hopefully I have better luck on my side of the field next time. I'm Tribal Kai. Thank you for watching.